Hi there. Do you know the difference between this sign and this sign? They look pretty much the same to us, don't they? I mean, to us Brazilians. Well, I guess some people might associate this one here, if you know a little bit about the hippie movement in the 60s with love and peace. And if you know a little bit about history, about the history of the Second World War, you will probably know, you probably know this, that Winston Churchill used to, to use this and to Churchill, that meant victory. But actually, in England, because that's where I lived for five and a half years, if you make the V sign with the palm of your hand facing you and the back of your hand fa facing the other person in front of you, that means something completely different. And that was a hard lesson that I learned in England. I learned in a very... <laughs> Looking back today, it was funny, but <laughs> I don't know. It scared me a little bit. But uh, let me avoid any spoilers here and let me construct the story with you. Because after all, you're here for a reason. This is Destination Fluency, a program designed to help you improve your listening skills and in the process, help you improve your fluency. Today's episode is about this. It's about culture shock. I was living in England at the time, and more specifically in London. This happened 25, about 25 years ago. I lived in London and I had a job at a disco in the west end of London. Now this part of London is famous because that's the place where the famous British English serial killer Jack the Ripper used to, to operate. That's the place where he, he killed most of his victims. Anyway, uh, I had been in London for about two months when I got this job, you know, I had a job in the construction industry. Wow, it was the simplest, most basic job you can think of. I was an assistant, I was a helper in the construction industry. I was not a qualified worker like a painter or a plumber or a car carpenter or a bricklayer or anything like that. No, I was just a helper and my job was to clean around the construction site after the other workers had done their jobs and to help them move things around. And for example, if we received a truckload of new supplies for, for the construction work that they were doing, uh, our job was to unload trucks like that and sometimes move things around the construction site. So basically that's what my job was. And I had a friend, a Brazilian friend, very nice person. And this guy had a job in the evening, I mean, on the weekends, you know, Friday and Saturdays, he, he used to work at, uh, at a disco. And uh, one day we were having a break, you know, uh, I, I think it was like a lunch break. And he told me about the, this job he had because on, I think it was on a Friday and he mentioned that, that that evening he had to go to work. And I got curious and I asked him about his job and I became very interested because the idea of that of having another job, you know, making some extra money really appealed to me. And then I asked him if he could help me, you know, if he could put a word for me with it, with his boss there in the in the disco and, and see if he could get a job for me. Now, my friend was um, simply in the disco. He was just a, what we, we called at the time a cup collector. Because you see, they used to serve drinks in this disco in small, well, in plastic cups. And so we had to collect these cups, bring them back to the bar. The, then the, these cups, they were washed and reused. And our job was that. We had to collect the cups. And then my friend found a job for me there. But the thing about this disco is that they usually for this kind of job, because it didn't require the person to speak English because uh, there was no interaction between them and the customers. So it didn't matter to the owners of this, this club if uh, we spoke English or not. So my friend had a very poor English. He didn't speak, speak English very well. But my English was quite good already. I was, was fluent in English. And so I went there and I started working at this disco. But, but because I spoke English, right, uh, very soon, uh, especially on busy nights, uh, they would call me inside the bar to help them wash the cups, you know, wash the, these cups, because we washed them by hands. We had a sink, a 
and we, we washed them by hands, but we also had a, a, wash, a washing machine. And then when, when and, and those nights when they got very busy because in this disco, they, they had a stage, you know, it was a very big place. They had three floors, three bars. They, there was a stage and uh, every Friday and Saturday, they had live performances, you know, they, they would bring bands, you know, uh, English bands, which were in the beginning of their careers to play there. And it's really incredible because I didn't know at the time, but I had the opportunity to, to be there when a famous band who, I mean, a band which today is very famous called Oasis. I'm just going to play a little, a little bit of Oasis for you here very quickly. This band here. Okay, so this is just for you guys to recognize the band in this town. So anyway, so they, they, they had live performances there. And at the time, this band was not famous and, and they played there. But to be honest with you, I didn't care much about the music at that time. You know, I used to work very hard in the construction site. So I went, when I went to this place at night, I was so tired and, and I didn't care much for the kind of music that they played in this club. It was not my my cup of tea. But anyway, so this club was, was like this. So sometimes, depending on the band, you know, they they got very busy. They sold lots of tickets and, and the place got really crowded. And on nights like that, many times I was asked to come inside the bar and help them wash the cups. And I did that and I was very efficient. I was, I, I worked very fast because, you know, I like to keep myself busy because since I used to be very tired from my, my, my day job, it was better for me if it, if it were busy because then I didn't have time to think about how, how tired I was and I just kept working as hard as I could. My bosses liked me because they, they knew how, how, how hard I worked and, and very soon, because I could understand the language, I mean, I could understand the customers. They started ordering drinks for me and I started serving them. And then I learned how to operate the cash register. And at some point I started serving drinks as well. Uh, but that, that started especially with, with the busy nights. So when they were not busy, because I was not a regular bar, bartender, I, I, I worked outside the bar collecting cups with my friend. And on quiet nights, my friend and I, we had, um, we had a deal, we had a system because both of us worked during the day and we were very tired. We used to go to work, especially on Saturdays, very tired, very, very tired. Because um, think about this, on a Friday night, we would finish at three o'clock in the morning, then go home and sleep for only two or three hours, then get up in the morning, go to work, because in the construction site, we worked Monday through Sunday. We worked, we worked seven days a week. We didn't have a break. So on Saturday morning, we, we woke up at around seven o'clock, sometimes even earlier, and we went to work. So imagine this. On Saturday, we would finish work at around five o'clock, come home, have something to eat, get a shower, and then go to the disco. And then work again until about three o'clock in the morning. And then on Sunday morning, we had to go to work again. So that way, on, on Saturday night, you, you can have an idea of how tired my friend and I were. Well, the thing is, we had this, this system, we had this deal. Uh, we had an agreement that one of us would cover for the other so that we could have a break. So we, we used to go to the toilet, sit in the toilet in one of the, the stalls in the toilet, close the door so that nobody would see us. And there we would, you know, sleep sitting down for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And while we, we were there, the other one had to cover uh, for the one who was sleeping, you know, who, for the one who was taking a break. Because there were three floors. We had to collect, collect cups in, on the three, for the three bars. And it was very important that we didn't let the, the, the cups to accumulate because if, if that happened, 
the owner of the bar, who was a very angry and aggressive Irishman, he would start suspecting us. And uh, I, I don't even want to think about what could happen to us if this guy found out that he was paying us to sleep in the bathroom. I think he would go very mad. But anyway, so that that was uh, that 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 was my story with with this job. And then, as I said earlier, uh, on busy nights, I used to go inside. I used to work behind the bar first, helping uh, them to wash to wash the cups. Uh, but then at some point uh, on a very busy night, uh, the, the manager came to me and said, oh, okay, Alfredo, I want you to, uh, okay, leave, leave the, the cups for the, for, the, for the other staff, those who don't speak English very well, because your English is good, so I prefer to have you in the bar, you know, serving our clients. And of course, because for her, it was much more interesting to have me selling drinks, you know, because that way they could make more money than to, to waste me, somebody who could help them, you know, serving drinks, just washing the cups. And so that's how I became uh, a bartender in, in, that, in that club. So one night, what happened was this. One night, uh, we had a busy night. And like I said, there were three floors, there were three bars, and uh, the top floor got very busy. So she received a call from, from upstairs from the other manager asking her to send someone up there to help them because they got very busy. And so she came to me and she said, hey, Alfred, I need you to go upstairs and help the, the people there in the top bar because they're very busy. And I said, okay, no problem. Because for me, it made no difference working downstairs or upstairs or working in the, 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 the bar that we had in the middle. For me, it was all the same. And there... I went. I went to the to the top floor uh, to help those guys. And uh, that night, the, the this particular night that I'm I'm talking about, it was a very busy night. And one of the bands playing that night was a punk rock band. Okay. Uh, by the way, at this point, I just would like to to take a moment here to show you a little bit, you know, about this place. Okay. So first of all, let me show you a picture of the building. <laughs> okay, so this is, so mind you that this is the east end of London. Okay, it's a, it's a neighborhood, it's an area there called New Cross. And this building here is the place where I used to work. Okay, you see this black building here? It was exactly like that. You know, a big black building. Uh, I, I've seen a recent pic picture of this place. It's no longer like this, but at the time they had painted it completely black because it was a disco, right? It was a nightclub. Okay. And I also discovered uh, recently that their logo, which was exactly like this, you know, and in front of the disco, we had a, a neon sign just like that. The name of the place was Venue, which by the way is a word in English that means the place, the location for something. So for instance, uh, suppose uh, there's going to be a concert here in Brazil and you ask, okay, but what's the venue? In other words, what is the place, the location where this concert is going to take place? And you might say, oh, it's going to be in Sao Paulo at Credit Card, Credit Card Hall. Okay, so Credit Card would be the venue for this place. So the name of the, the nightclub was the venue. So anyway, uh, back to, oops. Sorry. Okay. So this was the place, okay, in London, this disco, this nightclub called The Venue. So that night, my boss asked me to go upstairs. So they had a bar. And, uh, and it's great that I have this picture here because then I can show you exactly where the bar was. The bar was right there at the top, you know, at the very top. Because I remember that we could open one of the, the doors outside here. And we had a, an outside uh, balcony. And, and then from the balcony, we had a great view of uh, East London. Because the, the building was very, was very, I mean, what, it was like a three or four story building. So it's a quite, it was quite high. And from there, we had uh, a beautiful uh, view of uh, that area of London. So back to the story. So on that particular night, my boss came to me and told me to go to the top floor. And I did. I went upstairs and then I started working. 
And at this point, I would like to tell you something uh, peculiar about my work in this, in this disco. Uh, I think this was quite interesting. Um, the music that they played in this disco was so loud that we could not hear the customers. So if there was a, a person standing like one meter away from me ordering a drink, I could not get the sound coming from that person's mouth. So loud was the music. And then because of that, well, I ended up learning how to read lips in English. I could, <laughs> I could lip read my, my customers. You know, they came to the, the bar, they came to the counter and they ordered drinks and I could. I could read their lips and I could easily understand what they were asking for. And of course, I mean, after a while, it's get very easy because you have only so many things to remember. So it's not a big deal. It's not like I'm special or something. In, in a situation like that, you really learn things like that. But that was good news for me because I hated the kind of music that they played in that place. I really did. And it was very loud and it, and it really used to hurt me. So one day I saw a sound engineer. I mean, you know, the guy who, who used to do the sound check with the bands before each performance. I noticed that he used to wear earplugs, you know, to protect from the from the, the very loud uh, sound inside the disco. And then I decided to do the same thing, you know, since I was lip reading and I could not speak to 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 my customers anyway. I decided in that way it it it, it made my life it made my job more comfortable because it stopped hurting me. But that meant that. I could not hear my customers and actually it was pointless for me to speak to them. So most of the time I spoke very little to them. I, I, I gestured, I signaled, I used body language more than anything else. Because if I said something, I mean, they could read, uh, they could lip read me as well. But, um, but, my, but the point is, it was kind of pointless for me to, to try and, 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 talk out loud, you know, like to, to speak up because the sound was so, the, the sound of the music was so loud that it kind of muffled, it, it kind of killed uh, any sound that I produced. Anyway, so I couldn't hear my, my customers and my customers, I, my customers couldn't hear me. So I was upstairs, you know, in this top bar, top floor bar working. It was a very busy night. And I remember that between one customer and another, and I remember that between serving one customer and another, I remember that at some point I turned around back to the counter and uh, someone's, someone's eyes caught my eyes, you know, a client, a customer. And from a distance, I could see that he was, you know, he had locked on me. And, and then I signaled to him that I was ready to serve him. And then he asked for a couple of beers. He wanted to have two bottles of a beer called Newcastle Brown. And I'm going to show you a picture of this beer here, Newcastle Brown. Okay. It came in a large bottle like this, and it was a half a liter bottle. It was a big, very, quite large beer. So the guy wanted two of those. And I was standing close to the place where we kept the cold beers. You know, it was a small refrigerator. And then I, I, I could lip read, you know, I could really understand what he was asking, but I couldn't hear him. So in order to confirm, I turned to him and, and I, uh, because he had asked for two bottles. And then I said, oh, two. And at that moment, I noticed that something was wrong because that guy, he gave me a dirty look, you know. He, he looked at me in a very strange way, in a kind of a, a menacing way as if he, he wanted to hurt me somehow. I didn't know why. I didn't know what had happened. So anyway, I picked up a couple of bottles. I opened them and I put them on the counter. And then I distanced myself from the counter a little bit. And he asked me how much it was. And again, instead of speaking, I signaled. I said, two pounds. And then he gave me a second dirty look, you know, he had 
I would say he had a look of anger on his face. And then he reached into his pocket and he picked up some money. And then he extended his hand for me to pick up the money. And then when I went to pick up the money, he grabbed my hand with his other hand and he squashed it. But my hands were wa my, my but my hands were washed. I'm sorry, but my hands were wet because I had been washing something and I kind of slipped away from him and I, and I, you know, I pulled back. And at that very moment, I could see that this guy, he, he leaned forward, you know, in, in, onto the counter, almost as, as trying to, to, to jump over the counter. And I got really scared because it seemed that that guy was going to attack me. So behind me, there was a, an emergency button that we could press to call for security if we had trouble in the bar. And luckily, there was a security guard very close to the bar at that moment, and the guy rushed and, and, and stopped that guy and grabbed him and took him outside. And I, and, I, and I stood there frozen, not knowing what to do and not understanding what had happened. It was a, a very scary moment for me. And I don't know exactly... I, I think that the, the, the bar manager upstairs, you know, because in every bar there was a manager, there, there, there was this girl, she was Irish, her name was Noreen, and, and then, and, and she was very nice, she was very kind to me, she liked me because, I mean, uh, I was known as, as, a, as a hard worker, somebody who they could trust, and somebody who worked very hard all the time. So, anyway, uh, Noreen came to me, okay, wondering, trying to understand what had happened, and, I, and then I explained to her, Noreen, I, I don't know. I, I, I really can't explain what happened. The guy ordered a couple of beers. I served him. He asked the price. I told him. And, and when he was paying, he grabbed my hand. And it seems that he really wanted to hit me. And I, I feel lucky because the, the, the security guard was, was, was nearby and he was able to stop the guy. And at, and, at this point, and at this point, I realized that she really believed me because there was no reason for her not to believe me. I... There was no reason for me to lie because I had been working in that place for more than two years, you know, when this happened. Uh, and, and, and then she just turned to me and she said, yeah, you know, these, these people nowadays, uh, I mean, he was probably on drugs. He was probably high and probably he was mixing alcohol with drugs. And, you know, this is a, a dangerous mix, I think. Anyway. I didn't know what happened. Nobody understood what happened. And we just assumed that was a person on drugs going a little bit nuts. So I never thought much about that. But, but th that question kind of remained in the back of my mind for some time. Because I wondered what had triggered that. Because I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps the fact that, I mean, I didn't look... Uh, English, you know, I don't look English. I mean, I, I have a, uh, well, most people, when I lived in England, because of my face, my, my eyebrows, my hair, a lot of people thought I was from Turkey, because I, a lot of people thought I was Turkish, kind of got a big nose on. I don't know. So I didn't look English, and, 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 and it was clear to anybody, you know, watching me working behind the bar there, that I was a foreigner. I was a guy from another country working in England at that time. And I, and I thought that maybe that guy was upset about that because in a way I was getting jobs from, from local people, from local English young people that could be working there in that bar. So whatever the reason was, I, I, I could only uh, suspect, I could only um, speculate as to why the, this guy had done that. Okay, and then eventually I kind of forgot about that uh, I did not become traumatized by it anyway. But then, one and a half years later, maybe two years later, I was attending an English class because I was doing a prep course for the proficiency test that I was going to take. And the teacher, the English teacher, you know, he was teaching English to us. But that day was more about a history lesson, uh, a culture lesson, and about the language as well. And th this guy was telling us a story about 
about symbolism, symbolism about uh, signals, about gestures and things like that, and, and differences in culture. And then he mentioned this, that we as foreigners, we should be careful. Because, for example, sign like this means victory. Okay, and Winston Churchill, for example, he used to use this victory sign whenever he took a picture, whenever he, he talked to, to reporters and so on. Okay. And actually, I'm skipping some pictures here because in some pictures, you're going to see Churchill turning his hand as well. And today, I understand why in some pictures he was doing that. And I'm going to explain to you in a minute. But what happens is this. So if you go like this, you know, with the back of your hand facing you and the palm of your hand facing the person in front of you, this means victory. So as a reference to the time of the war, victory against, against Germany, vic victory against Hitler, because Churchill strongly believed that they were going to win the war, that they would be victorious in that war. So that's why he always made that sign. Okay, but if you study history, if you, if you study European history, you are going to learn that for more than 100 years, France and England were at war. But at the time, the weapons they had at their disposal were these, bows and arrows. Okay, so, uh, I forgot to share my... <laughs> The pictures I, I select for today with you. Let me go back a little bit. So, guys, oh, here is Churchill, okay? So, the, the British Prime Minister at the time of the Second World War. So, whenever he, he, he was outside talking to the press, talking to reporters, or visit, visiting a bomb site or something like that, he would make that, that sign, which meant victory against Germany. Okay? Right. But uh, if you study a little bit about, about European history, you're going to learn that France and England were at war for 100 years. And at the time, you know, the weapons they had were bows and arrows. Bow, the arch, and arrows. Okay? And so what happened was that every time the French captured an English bowman, they would cut off these two fingers so that this guy could not shoot anymore. You know, he, he could not shoot with his bow. He, he, not could, he could not shoot an arrow. And then every time the two armies uh, came face to face, the British, you know, from wherever they were, they would go like this. They would show their fingers showing that they could still fight, they could still kill them. Well, that was the, the, the meaning of this gesture back in the Middle Ages, you know, in the, the war of the 100 years. But in modern times, this became the equivalent of this. So in British English, these two signs, they mean, they mean more or less the same thing. And that's why I think that Churchill also used this because you know when Churchill turned his hands around like that I think he was he was telling that to Hitler it was a message to Hitler saying look you know go f yourself I suppose that that was the message so it was a double message it, it meant victory but I suppose it was also Churchill's insult to Hitler I mean this is my suspicion okay well, but then at this point, I guess you can understand what happened to me back in the bar. So think about this. I was there, you know, in this club, working as a bartender behind the bar, minding my own business, you know, trying to be nice to people. And mind you, I had even learned to lip read because the sound was so loud, I couldn't hear people, but I could read their lips very well. I really could understand what they were asking for. It was easy for me. And then I was there and, and I was at the bar. I was close to the, the refrigerator where these beers were. And the guy asked for two bottles of Newcastle Brown. That's the name of the, that, that beer. 
Can I have a can I have two bottles of Newcastle Brown? In purple, he did like this. Can I have two bottles of Newcastle Brown? Well, and even though this guy was was there, you know, for a punk rock concert, looking back and you know reflecting about it, uh, I would have to say they were usually very polite. You know, I remember that. I remember serving these guys at the counter, and and I remember paying attention to the way they would politely ask for a beer and always say, excuse me, please, thank you, and so on. And I think this guy did the same. But I was so busy, you know, uh, that night, and I was so focused, uh, I was so focused on serving them as quickly as possible. So when we locked eyes, and, and, I, and I knew he wanted a, a drink, my, my, my priority was to serve it, to serve him. So from a distance, I told him, okay, go ahead, tell me what you want. So it was almost like this, you know, I said, okay, tell me what you want. I can I can read your lips, go ahead. And I could, and he said something and from a distance and ah, okay. So you want two, two Newcastle Browns. Yeah, two of those. And then this guy gave me a dirty look, you know, he went like this. And I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was, so. Maybe I didn't pay much attention to it. So then I went there, I opened the two bottles, put on the counter, pulled back a little bit. He asked for the price and I said, well, it's one pound each, so that's two pounds. And then I did it again. So I guess at this point, this guy thought, oh, this bloody foreigner, he's messing up with me. Who the hell, do, who the hell does he think he is insulting me like that? Anyway, he picked up the money and he stretched his hands. And when I went there, because you know, I guess that because I had not read the signals, I mean, I didn't know what was going on, to this guy, I must have uh, come across, you know, I, 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 must have, I, must, I must have looked like somebody who was not only a foreigner, but also an arrogant foreigner, you know, a, a kind of a, a disrespectful person. Well, I don't know. What I, what I do know is that when I tried to pick up the money, he grabbed my hands and, I, and he pulled me. Luckily, my, my hands were wet, they were, slipper, they were slippery, and I got away. And the, the security guard came and, and got the guy and then put him out of the club. I feel sorry for him because it was nothing more than a, a misunderstanding. So we could call this, what, a cultural misunderstanding and that's it, you know, that's the, and that's the story that I wanted to share with you. Because you see, it took me about two years to figure out what happened. Because the night it happened, it puzzled me. I got really confused and I had no idea why that had happened. No idea at all. But then two years later, in the middle of an English class, in the middle of a history class, because actually that, that was more like a history class, everything made sense to me. It, it dawned on me uh, why that guy had attacked me the way he had. So my advice to you is this. You're learning a, a second language. Uh, be open, be prepared uh, to, to explore cultural aspects of the language be open to learning a little bit about the history of the country, the history uh, of uh, the countries where this language is spoken. Because a lot of times there are things that you're, uh, there are things that you, you will only understand if you know a little bit about their history, if you know a little bit about their culture. So I think it's, it's kind of important. So that's why I wanted to share this with you tonight. And if you travel to England, Knowing this, you know, learning this lesson from me today, this is a problem you're not going to have. You're not going to uh, uh, use this sign, even if you want to order two of something in a restaurant, you're never going to do that. Most probably, you're going to go with the, with the V sign as opposed to the F sign. Okay, so I... Uh, not not only because it happened to me, but I, I think this is an interesting story. You know, it, it's really interesting how inadvertently, because you don't know the language, because you don't know the culture, you might end up 
offending, insulting someone. So once again, I hope you found the, the tip useful. This is Destination Fluency. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel because that way you can be informed of all of our upcoming videos. Okay, I'll see you there. Bye.